Today, I want to introduce Linda James to you. She's a visual artist and educator, and she has been a visual artist for over 40 years. During that time, she has applied her talents to graphic design, fiber art, and painting. She now spends all of her time painting and teaching watercolor as a vehicle for personal expression. When I first saw Linda's work online, I felt a sense of connection with the deeper nature of consciousness beyond our ego. It's this sense of connection that comes through very strongly for me when I look at Linda's work. It's so sensual and organic and soft, yet very dense in color and appearance, very different from the way I work with watercolor. This is also why I felt that it would be really interesting to do this interview with Linda and hear more about her process. Linda, welcome to this interview. I've been really looking forward to it. Um, would you like to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, your reason for becoming an artist? Well, first of all, I would say there was never any decision made about becoming an artist for me. You know, from the time I was little, I just enjoyed making art. And, um, and it, I, so I would say it was more of a calling than it was, you know, a choice. Um, and uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I, um, and then after meeting my, my husband at the time, uh, we moved to the East Coast, and there I um, I became. First of all, I I got very enchanted with fiber art when I was in college, um, towards the end of my time there, and so I I became a fiber artist and um, had a studio with another weaver, and we um, we taught classes and did commissions and so forth. And I was very much interested in that for, for a time. Um, and then later on, I took a week-long class with a um, um, in herbal medicine with a teacher who mm -hmm. was a Philip Deer. He was a Muscogee Creek. Um, at the time, you could, could have called him a medicine man, but I think that's an elder. Um, would be the more appropriate term. And um, I just became absolutely passionate about herbs and about um, their healing properties. And so that that went, that took me away from art for a little bit of time. And, and then I, but for the longest time, I wanted to put the two together, to put art and, and all that I had learned about the green world together and I think that it's only been in the last decade that I feel like I've actually um, accomplished that to some extent. So when you say that you feel that you've really accomplished bringing the two together, in what way do you feel that you've been successful? It started with the prayer paintings. I have a uh, prayer painting series, it's on my website through studying herbs and understanding that we are in a vibrational universe and that um, herbs are vibrational beings, trees are vibrational beings, um, mm -hmm. just as much as we are. Eventually, I, I came to understand that the power of intent can change vibrational energy. That if you if you really focus an intent or a prayer, you could call it a prayer just as well. That um, that it's very powerful, and so I started just with friends. I started to um, take their prayers with their permission, take their prayers and turn them into visual works of art. It was also inspired by Aboriginal painting and the and that focus that that goes into those paintings with dots or lines or you know whatever, that there is a prayer connected. There was a major exhibit at the Seattle Art Museum in 2012, which had a tremendous impact on me. And I was so moved by it. Um, I mean, there are families 
families of artists who um, their, their particular style of painting is something that is handed down from generation to generation. You find this in a lot of indigenous cultures actually. And, um, and that's when I started incorporating dots into my work. They don't always show up in everything I do, but, um, but they, are, they show up, they do show up in a, a number of my prayer paintings and in a number of the series that were created right after during that period of time. But it's, it's more about a focused intent and when you're doing something like putting dots into a painting, it gives you a focus like a meditative act. And, in, and that prayer can go into every one of those dots or every stroke. So it's, um, it's really about intent. Intent and, and intent, I, I tend to like to use that word better than prayer. Prayer can be people, everyone has their own interpretation of what prayer is. Hmm. But focused intent is really what it's about. And so some of the prayer paintings um, incorporate sacred geometry as a format. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, um, well, they all, a lot of them incorporate sacred geometry, but they all include that, that focused intent connected to the prayer that the person gave to me. Um, so it's my way of interpreting. So a lot of a lot of my work actually is trying to visually interpret something that is pretty um, transcendent or elusive. You know, it's pretty hard to, to name. Um, and so that's a so a lot of my work really is connected to that that focus. When I look at your work, one of the things that, that also strikes me is the, the texture that appears in your watercolor paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone myself working with watercolor, um, you know, the, the thing that, that really struck me was how textured they seem like but in a dense fashion, but still with quite a lot of translucency to them. And I was just, I was really struck by that. Some of the works that I was struck by was Orbits and Interpreting Shakti. Um, various others also Path of Least Resistance and some of the lunar uh, cycle paintings. and. Uh, in a landscape and remembered there's a number of your paintings that all strikes me as surprising for a watercolor work for for different reasons but yeah. but but yeah. it's it's surprising and even more um capturing you know because i'm surprised that it's what you know i was delighted when I found out it was watercolor, but it also obviously made me curious. So can you tell us something about your technique? Well, there, there are a couple of different ways that I get um, those textures. Some of the paintings you described, like Orbits, that one um, is done primarily with a technique called scumbling which is a dry brush technique where you are basically um, applying a dry brush stroke over another color. Um, in fact, I'm looking at it right now. Um, and it, um, it takes practice, it takes a lot of practice to do that because um, it, it has to be just so, you know, so I end up doing a lot of strokes on a, scrap paper before I actually will apply it to the painting. But it creates this effect of, um, it's almost like an atmospheric effect around, like in the case of orbits, it looks like a planet or, you know, the moon or something. 
and and what you're seeing is um, is this halo around it, and that's done. It's done totally with dry brush using fairly thick paint and applying it in in a particular way on top of um, in this case in that case black. In my Cosmos series where I did um, Within Darkness, it really shows up on that piece as well. But it's also a combination of scrubbing. There's there's scumbling, which is applying um, kind of a, a heavy mix of paint to water on on top of so a dry brush stroke on top of another color, and then there's scrubbing where you, you take many you build up several layers, and then you scrub down. So you're taking a brush. There are actual scrubbing brushes that okay. exist. Um, I just use a really beat up old brush is what I use for that. <laughs> for that purpose. Um, but I, it, it's a particular way of the brush head needs to be damp, but not wet, you know, very, very tricky in that way. But you, you're brushing the top layer off. It's what you're doing. You're kind of brushing the top layer off, revealing um, layers underneath. Yeah. Um, and you might be able to go down one or two layers, depending on how many you've built up. Yeah. And it, it creates a beautiful, a beautiful effect. That appears in some of the paintings that you described, but um, some of the others, the a lot of like um, 2020 remembered, that one is as much more, I'm, I'm making use of granulating pigments much more. Water is the, what stimulates that granulation. So the more water, the more it will do this reticulation. Yeah. And, um, and that's what you see in that painting. That's the texture is created with, with granulation. And that color in particular, there's lunar black all over that piece. It's interesting to hear you talk about how the technique, how you're working the technique and also really interesting because obviously you have years of experience working with watercolor and exploring the watercolor and exploring the different techniques that you can use. It does justice to your, I don't know how much you've studied the color field painters, but you mentioned them uh, as, oh, yeah. as part of your inspiration. When I'm thinking, you know, I've been look, looking at your work, I've been thinking, you know, is that, which colors underneath and which is on top sometimes, you know, when I'm looking at certain of your works, which is the feeling that you can sometimes as well get with uh, a Rothko, you know, you're looking at a Rothko and you're thinking, what's, what is actually shining through what here, you know, but you're managing to do that with watercolor, which I think is, is really amazing. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> One of the biggest influences in my work is Mark Rothko, for sure. Um, it goes back to when I was in college. Um, he was still alive at that point. And I was just blown away first time I ever saw one of his paintings. It just struck me. Um, and I think so in my being a colorist at this point is, is definitely goes back to that influence of Mark Rothko. Are there any other artists maybe living today, any contemporary artists that are uh, inspirational to you? Well, in, a, in, a, in terms of um, abstraction and spirituality, I can name some. Uh, Sohan Kadri. Oh, no, he isn't, a, he isn't alive. Dear, <laughs> unfortunately, many have passed recently. Sohan Kadri um, was a yogi. I mean, he was, um, his work, his art was his spiritual practice. They were entwined. They were one and the same. And, um, and that has always inspired me. I don't feel like I'm anywhere near that kind of place with my work, um, where it's that closely associated, you know. But for example, the prayer paintings, and I mean, there's, that's, that's it moving in that direction. And this latest series that I have behind me, the, the liminal space series is kind of working in that direction too. I don't think I ever totally understood what liminal space was until last year when um, because of COVID, because of the pandemic, I 
couldn't go visit my mother who was in hospice in Wisconsin. And so um, when we had enough warning before she passed that my sister who was living nearby um, got both of my, my other sister and I, Julie was in Ohio and I was in Wisconsin, I was in Seattle and um, on Zoom. So we spent that, those last hours with my mother on Zoom and uh, witnessed her passing. And I mean, which was a very, as you can imagine, a very emotional experience. But what happened afterwards was that both Julie, who lived, lives in Ohio, and I experienced the strangest distortion of time and space. It was like we, um, it was as if we were there and we felt like we were there. We definitely felt like we were right there. And so we had jet lag. We, we didn't know what time it was or what day it was for pro this went on for maybe three days. It was this, and it was a very amazing experience. And, and that was, that was a very real experience of liminal space where we were in between. We didn't, you know, we thought we were there, but we weren't there. Um, and of course, my mother was also in liminal space passing from one, one thing to another. So, so this whole series was created. I'm, so the, the purpose was for me to interpret, I wanted to interpret that in the way it felt, the way it felt to me. And so, um, so that's, this series came from that. It came out of, that's one of the few that came out of personal experience, of, a very profound personal experience. So this is a really good example, your most recent yeah. work of how you're using that as a, you know, as a vehicle for personal expression. When I think about, um, when I think about what, what uh, my, my feeling of the creative, creative expression is, you know, I don't view it as, as, as revealing or, um, talking at all about any aspect of me personally. It's, it's much, I feel like it's much more um, a process of tuning into um, your inner being, if you want to call it that, your soul, that, that conduit, like your right brain pathway that takes you to the divine, so that you end up, I feel like cre creativity, intuition, all of those things, are that it's all um, it's all creating a pathway or um, a vehicle for your own creative expression. We can all do it. I mean, it's you know everyone has the same capability. You're teaching people how to do watercolor, how to use watercolor as a vehicle for personal expression. How easy. Is it for people to actually, one thing is learning watercolor, but another is learning how to use it as a, as a vehicle for personal expression. How, how are people finding that? I think, um, well, I mean, first of all, I feel like you do, yes, you do have to learn technique. You, knew, you do have to start at the beginning, you know, and become more adept at working with the materials. Mm -hmm. But um, the beauty of watercolor is water. It's it's water, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and it's working with because water is also a very vibrational thing. And and when you think about the fact that water is makes up most of the earth, it makes up more than half of our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's water's it, water is everything, and it um, and it's a wonderful thing. To work with in terms of a um, a medium, water and pigment, you know, and it's to me it's like alchemy. You you know you're you're working with you're working with the force of water combined with with the pigments and and what they can do and what they can offer and so 
to get to that place after you've learned all your te your technique and so forth. I feel like it's it's doing. Um, I, I try to do an exercise in my more advanced class. We start off every class doing a 10 minute intuitive painting session where we start with a brief meditation and then we go into um, literally, I mean, you, you have everything set up and ready to go, but you don't know where you're going. You're not planning anything. You're not thinking. You try not to be using that left left brain side of your brain. You know, you are literally just flowing and um and i keep it short so that you don't have time to get all you know to think about it too much <laughs> and um and it's a great way to start to get in tune with just what it feels like to just be just be it's it's where work becomes your your artwork becomes a meditation actually on your website you have a lot of uh, series you know it, it your work is kind of arranged in series so it seems like you prefer working in series rather than do individual work but am I mistaken in that some series are open you know they they just they're open for me to keep adding to and then some are finite like the um, spirit and matter series was nine and that was where it stayed you know i reached nine and that's all that i didn't want to do anymore the concept of the path of least resistance which basically is just i was trying to imagine what it would look like what would that look like visually and i imagined this op this kind of v you know where it's starting off narrow and then it gets wider yeah. or whatever happens to it you know the different pathways that it might take in order for you to finally let go of your resistance, let go of those things that those thoughts or perceptions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that so once I did the first one, um, then I just wanted to I wanted to explore that. It's it's like it's an easy concept to continue to explore because there are all kinds of ways. You can do that. I do have a number of individual paintings, though. They aren't all in series. They don't all, some of them just happen. And like uh, 2020 remembered, there's nothing that followed that. Uh, I couldn't, there was nothing that else I could do with that. You know, that, that was a statement. Yeah. That was a statement that didn't need any more. One of the pictures that I really just was just immediately in love with when I saw it was interpreting Shakti One, which has this amazing orange color, as you can see, and it's just the the warmth in that color is so immediate and so striking, probably because personally, I'm quite a cold person. I'm Northern Scandinavian. And, uh, you know, I just, I prefer cold a lot of the time. So this is probably why this is so impactful to me, but also the orange color uh, for me stands for this creativity and sexuality. There's, there's so many things connected with this vibrant uh, orange color and, heat that seems to almost emanate from this picture as well as the blue disc uh, blue green disc which is a sort of complementary color just it's just really striking I find so do you want to say something about your Shakti painting or the whole series perhaps sure um, you said that very well actually you described it really perfectly. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to read from something because I, I feel like um, to give you a, a definition of what Shakti is mm -hmm. for those out there who don't know that. Um, Shakti is the primordial cosmic energy and represents the dynamic forces that are thought to move through the universe in Hinduism. Shakti is the personification of divine 
feminine creative power. That's what it is. And um, so, so that, that's what I'm, that's what I was focused on. And I think you, you pretty much described it in your reaction to that, that first painting, the Shakti one painting. Um, that, uh, that was by far my favorite of the series. This is one of those series that is pretty minimal. I mean, there aren't that many paintings. Um, and I, I find it really hard now to create anything new. It's like they, there was this moment in time when, when I created these and, um, and, it's, and it's gone essentially. You know, so I feel like I feel like there aren't going to be any more. That's not going to be an open series. Um, but it um, and it was also uh, it was also a painting that was both inspired by tantric art in terms of the forms, but um, but was very intuitive in terms of what I did in the internal part of the painting. Very intuitive. So um, I was respond. I felt like I was responding to what what Shakti is all about. What would be your mm -hmm. advice to people wanting to start out with watercolor? The people who've maybe never done watercolor before. Look at look at lots of art. Expose yourself to lots and lots of art for the person who's just getting started. Um, see what's out there and, um, and find teachers or mentors um, that are, whose work inspires you. Be very selective about that. Um, because if, if their work inspires you, that doesn't mean they're good teachers. <laughs> However, it doesn't always mean that. A lot of times it is, it will. And, um, and so be selective about your teachers and, um, and go for what moves you. In other words, trust, your, trust yourself. What is, what is moving you? What, what um, resonates, resonates with you, you know? And what would your advice be to people who has worked with watercolor for a while, but maybe want to take it to a, a different level in the sense they want to do more kind of intuitive work with watercolor. For people who have already been painting for quite a while and, um, and want to go kind of the next step, um, probably the most important thing is to have a meditation practice. And so if you're not already doing that, um, I, I recommend that you do um, because, because that's the best way to access the kind of inspiration that you're going to be drawing from. So and that's kind of the, pl the place to begin. That's probably true for a beginning person too. I mean, doesn't doesn't matter. That, that's uh, an important place to begin. Um, Stay hydrated. That may sound like a really weird thing to, to suggest. But um, once again, going back to this whole concept about water, um, water, water is a vehicle for, um, for communication. The more hydrated you are, the more receptive you are. And um, I find that it, and I, I often fight with dehydration. I, I don't drink enough. And I can tell, I can tell because my meditation just, you know, it, it's much less productive when I'm feeling that way. Water is really an important, really very important. So strange as, strange as a, that may be for advice, um, stay hydrated. <laughs> it's good for your health anyway. But it's also good for, in terms of that, being receptive to the divine, being receptive to the universe or God or whatever, whatever terms you're comfortable with. Yeah.
So if people want to, because you teach, if people would want to get in touch with you, they've seen some of your work now in this video, and maybe if they like it and either want to start out doing watercolor themselves or have practiced watercolor for a while, but want to take it to the next level, where do you, uh, can, can you be reached? How can they contact you and get in touch with you for potential teaching sessions? Well, what I suggest is um, going to my website, which is uh, lindajamesart.com. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you can contact me through the contact form. I also have an Etsy shop where um, I'm where I turned I turned the prayer paintings into blank greeting cards. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of inspirational cards with prayers connected to them. Um, so I've got those on an Etsy site, which is Linda James Art in that case again. I would encourage everyone to go and check out Linda's website, uh, have a look at uh, the beautiful paintings that she's done and um, really take them in. Even if you know, you're in a situation where perhaps right now you can't afford to buy one, then you can always sit and just gaze at the paintings and take them in that way. But if you can afford to buy a painting, then I would encourage you to support Linda as an artist and um, continue so she can continue her artistic journey and I would like to say thank you to you Linda for uh, joining me for this interview so we can get the word out about your art and allow me to tell people about the work that you're doing which is great I think so thank you so much for being part of this interview tonight all the best of luck thank in the future. You. thank you Grit this has been wonderful I really appreciate this time spent with you